Greetings, Karate Illuminati. This is Noah, and I am at Peaceful Warrior Martial Arts uh, and Healing Center in Scottsdale, Arizona. Uh, just finished teaching the Saturday morning classes, and I am ready to get going on my live session. I'm a couple minutes late, so I do apologize for that. Uh, for those who are tuning in but don't really know what uh, we're going to go through, uh, this is going to be a kind of quick overview of mechanics with uh, the Karana Hanshi. Now, there are several different versions of that, uh, so I'm going to be focusing on the Shorinryu uh, Kobayashi version of that, um, but you can take that and apply it however you wish with your versions. So, um, if you know the Kata and you know some mechanical uh, aspects of it, what I'm going to go over may be a little different than what you do, but that's okay. It's good to get other people's opinions and perspectives on things. So with that, let's set the phone up and get things started. So this is something that I've wanted to do a video on for quite some time, uh, but it is actually a little difficult to uh, record a video and get kind of a, a good sense of it. So with uh, the Naihanshi Kata, you have Naihanshi Dachi. Now, this would be different if we were talking about kishimoto -di, where I would be in Shikodachi, which is a different story. Uh, some styles also do more of a Kibadachi, uh, which is kind of a little bit of a different situation. But for our purposes, we're going to look at Naihanshi Dachi. So with Naihanshi Dachi, your feet are a little farther apart than shoulder width. Uh, one way to measure it uh, is you can turn one of your feet and drop it. And if you can fit your fist between your knee and your foot, you are the right distance apart. So a little bit wider than shoulders. And the toes a little bit turned in. So we'll imagine the palms of my hands are the bottoms of my feet, and these are my toes. We're going to turn them in slightly. Now the whole reason for doing that, it seems very unusual at the time. So it takes some getting used to, and you kind of have to accept the weirdness for a little while. But there's reasons for doing that. So, of course, we need to make sure that our knees track over our toes. That is a basic uh, tenant of anything physical that requires your legs. Your knee needs to track over your toes, otherwise you're going to hurt yourself, right? If we're thinking squats, normally you're going to have your feet set at angles, and as you squat, you need to make sure your knees go out over your toes. They don't wobble at all, they don't sag. Those are things that are gonna lead to injury. With Naihanshi Dachi, it looks like your knees are sagging a little bit, right? And that's because you are having some bend in the knees so that you can have tension here. If your toes are bent in like that a little bit, what that allows you to do is turn your femurs also, okay? So it's not that I am turning my toes and having my knees go a different direction, if that makes sense. My feet are turned in at an angle, my femurs turn at an angle. So my knees are actually pointing the same direction as my toes. And if I move my hips, which requires me to use my legs, I'm exaggerating a lot so you can see this. But my knee is tracking over my toes. It's not over my toes in this plane, right? It's not like a front stance kind of a situation where it's vertically straight over this way. It's straight in that I'm applying pressure at this angle, if that makes sense. Almost like you're pressing down and out, right? Kind of, I'm on puzzle mats. If I was on a seam trying to push it apart, that kind of a thing. If you're doing that, then you are changing the vector of pressure from straight over it to the angle that you're applying pressure. And so in that line of pressure, my knee and my toes are tracking on the same line. It's hard to see on camera, unfortunately. It's much easier to explain in person. But from the side here, right, this whole part of my leg is turned to go in the same direction as my toes this way. If my toes were pointed in any other direction, then this would not work, right? If my toes are pointed forward, and I try to bend my knees, at this point, even pushing out, I can't move them very much. Because if I start to move, now my knee is traveling inward, 
but my toes are pointed forward. So you see how that would cause a problem structurally. Having this turned in stance from a purely structural perspective allows me to use my legs to generate rotational power this way, keeping my knees tracking over my feet in a stance that is structurally kind of evenly weighted. If that makes sense. I'm gonna check and make sure no crazy questions yet. All right, I've got some thumbs up, so hopefully this is making sense to people. So again, from this stance, you have a fundamental platform for generating rotational power. That is the key thing about Naihanchi. If you were to uh, look at some of the writings of Motobu Choki, for example, he will tell you that twisting to the left and right in Naihanchi Dachi is how you fight. And that is one way to look at it. Um, and if you're looking at the kata specifically, you have to do a lot of rotation in this stance. Right, to be able to do all of the motions that you're gonna do. So that's a really important thing about the stance that really gets overlooked and is hard to understand when you're just viewing it, right? So one of the things that I'll see a lot is people will have this idea that your knees are wobbling, right? Because if I was in Shikodachi, for example, and I tried to move my hips, it's going to make my knees wobble side to side. And if you look, you'll see the side to side wobble, but my toes are staying in the same place. That's why this Nahanshidachi position is important. It looks like knee wobble, right? From the perspective you guys have right now, this looks like knee wobble. And it looks like it would be bad. But if you look down, and we'll see if I can point my camera that way. Let's give it a shot shall we? So, if we look down at my leg, if you were looking directly down it, you can hopefully see there's this straight shot down my leg to my toes. And if I'm moving, my knee tracks directly over my toes. So, I know it's not ideal camera work, but hopefully it gives you the idea. So, uh, you have to understand what you're looking at, right? This rotation only happens because of this stance. Any other stance, you can't do that rotation as effectively or as safely. Now, because of the position of the feet too, you can either pull with your hip, that's one of the feelings you can go for is the pulling, or you can go for the pushing. And of course you can combine both directions uh, in real application, which one you do is sort of irrelevant. It's a mental exercise uh, to help you envision what you're trying to do, whether you are pulling something or pushing something. So once you understand how all that stuff works, right? Once you have the foundation, you can start building things on top of it. So we get into the kata itself. When we look at the applications for the kata, they are put together in such a way that sometimes you have to double the hip motion if you want to put power into it the way you would expect. So we'll get into some of that, uh, and then some of it you can play with uh, the hip movement a little bit. So when we go from this uh, position to start with, I'm gonna mostly do all this stuff kind of stationary. I'm not gonna do the cross steps too much, uh, and Prodigy Karate, I probably will. This is hopefully saving to my phone, but if not, I have an alternative way to get it back. So uh, I will probably post this later, yes. Uh, and it will be available on Instagram for the next 24 hours anyway. So, as I said, I'm not going to do too much with the cross steps. I don't have a lot of room in my camera, right, to be able to do the whole thing um, and keep track of everybody. But uh, what I will say about the cross steps in this kata is different styles do it different ways. They'll open feet, they won't open feet. They'll go, for example, toe to toe is the way that we're technically supposed to do it in my system, is set pinky toe to pinky toe, cut back around and then slide out. Um, but other styles will do those steps differently. It's not so much something that 
I think needs to be harped on. What you need to focus on in that stance is what it does. This crossed position, however you do it, has to center your weight over your feet. It has to keep your legs in a nice tight position that you can twist from because that's one of the applications for any sort of a cross stance. This cross stance, for example, from Pasai, you spin from that, right? This cross step, you spin. You see that in Nahate systems, like uh, you'll see it in Salem Chin, for example, or Sun Chin. You do this step across twist. So anytime you are crossing feet like that, you're set up to spin. So you have to maintain balance in that stance so that you could spin if you wanted. The other thing it's useful for is Tai Sabaki, or your evasion. So for example, in Kishimoto Di, you will either twist to that stance and then step out, or you will step to that stance and then step out. So it's sort of in the sense of Naihanshi, it's telling you what you are going to use to transition. How you use that stance is very open to interpretation. So I'm not gonna get into that too much. I'm gonna focus mostly on structural things and mechanical things and power. So if we look at from here, right? Because of that step across, one of the things it does do is it sets your hips at a certain angle, right? So depending on how you step out from that is going to depend what kind of uh, rotation you do. So if I step across and I cut around and then come out, I have set my hips back on this side, which means I can throw them that way, right? And oh, double check. Absolutely, Martin. Greetings. So again, if I step across and cut around, then I've centered myself again. And as I step out, I can throw my hips this direction. I again have to have this stance this way. This leg is going to push, this leg is going to pull, and that is going to effectively move my hips this way, which will allow me to connect my hip through my uh, gamaku, which uh, is the usage of this entire section of your body, just to simplify it, to my upper body to whip this direction, right? Alternatively, maybe you're one of the ones that opens and then steps, in which case I'm not going to have rotational power this direction. I'm going to have rotational power that direction, this way. This hip comes forward. So it's more of a uh, shooting type of situation. Uh, you'll see that in things like Kishabajuku. They extend that straight out, or at least they did for a while. They kind of tweak things sometimes, and I'm not part of their style, so I don't keep up with it. But in that case, right, you would step out, set into your stance, and when you set, this hip is going to come forward, which means you can extend this way, essentially like throwing a jab, right? So either way, you are putting your hip into it, but you can do it different ways depending on how you step. So you can see how I really try to take the approach personally of taking a look at all the different other perspectives. Because even though my style does it one way, and their style does it another way, and their style does it another way, does not mean any of them are wrong. They are all just different perspectives on similar ideas. So sticking with the way that I do it for now for ease of use for me, because it's what I'm more comfortable with and more understanding of. I've set into this stance, and I have the ability to throw my left hip in this case this way to throw the height of uke. Now, normally when you do this, if I slow it down, you'll throw the hip out and then you'll lock it back, right? This helps you arrest that movement. If you are hitting a target, you don't really need that pullback so much because you'll just let the target stop your strike, right? But sometimes you wanna control it, limit its range, not overthrow. So having that little pullback will help you with that. What that little pullback helps you do also, in this case, is set for that elbow, right? Because this comes back a little reset, now your hip 
has that range of motion on this side again to throw that elbow with power. If you don't do that, you have to double rotate that hip. You rotate it, keep it where it is, and rotate it again, which is a much shorter rotation. That takes a lot more work to get power into. It is something I really highly recommend you try to do, is try to hip hip in the same direction without resetting. It is a little more of an advanced way to do it as opposed to hip, reset, hip, okay? Um, but it is something to definitely play with and try and experiment. <laughs> hey, Jesse. Uh, I mean, my first blog was Budo Geek, I will have you know, actually. So not, not uh, terribly surprising that I'd be a karate nerd. So once we've got that idea down, you've gotten the chance to look at just with the first two steps, some different aspects of how this step sets up your hips, right? And how you're going to use that to generate power. I've got my throwing it. I, I liken this to sort of a baseball bat swing, right? This side of my body is going to throw everything that direction. I'm essentially swinging baseball bat when I throw this out here, right? Same thing with throwing that elbow. If I do the extension though, it's not so much swinging a baseball bat anymore, is it, right? That's that thrusting extension that you get, like I was talking about more of a jab. So you've already got two different ways to look at that. Uh, and thank you, Lucas, I appreciate it. So from here, then we have this stacked hands and then we go into the next two movements. That stacked hands position is going to kind of mess with what you do next because how are you using that stacked hands? So if I've done my double hit, for example, one reset, two, right? I can stick with that theme and I can go pull, pull if I want to. So I can pull my hip away and pull it back, right? because this is going to be pulling something. The only reason for me to put both hands over on one side of my body is if I had a hold of something real good and pulled it over here, whether that's their head, their arm, their leg, doesn't really matter, but I pulled it over to this side, right? Don't have to, of course. Now that I'm over here, I can just pull this way. By pulling my left hip back, I'm now doing a short, tight pull straight to my side. So you have two different ways of doing it you have to figure out what kind of application you're using, which of those mechanics works better for that application. If you're doing more of a, uh, let's say a head twist, then probably this tighter straight pull is gonna be better for you, right? Because it maintains this tight twist. An arm bar though, you might want more of a larger pull. You're gonna want that reset first to get that extension. So you have to, look at your application and make sure that your mechanics make sense for that. Or play with your mechanics and play with your applications in kind. So again, you've got either one, two in the same direction, or you've got one reset two. Okay. And then from here, you've got straight pull by pulling this hip back, right? Pulling everything tight, or you've got pull across pull back. Different options. Now we're doing two actions in the same direction again. Now Hanchi does this a lot, right? One, two. One, two. We're going to do two actions in the same direction. So we have the same options, right? We've got either one, two, where we can throw the hit partially, throw the hit the rest of the way, or we've got hit, reset, hit. Both are fine something for you to play with in your application and just kind of in your practice. So again, hit, hit, or hit, reset, hit. Nice thing about uh, this is what I mentioned with the haito uke versus doing it more of a thrust motion applies here too with the geran barai. Everybody expects your geran barai to be a sweeping action this way, and so they want their hip to move with it for power, right? They want this to swing strong. 
And so they'll do that in their hunchy as well. From here, they'll swing this hip forward, this hip back, so that swings with power. Nothing wrong with that at all. You can, however, do a gedonbarai the other way, throwing this hip forward. Same kind of thrusting feeling, right? Depends what application that you're doing. Why well, you would reset versus continuous. Bunkai style or what the difference is. Uh, so, Lucas, with why you would do one versus the other, one is easier to hit harder. That's really the, the basic of it, uh, uh, basic take on it, right? If I go hit, reset, hit, it's easier for me to hit hard that way. If I go hit, hit on one path of motion, it's harder for me to generate more power. It's faster, so you have that going for you. Uh, but you also have the ability to consider your opposite hand, right? So if I'm looking at this, for example, reset, hit, that reset means this hand, my pulling hand, my hikite, gets some extra power to it. So if it was grabbing something, right, clearing something out of the way, for example, as I strike, then I hit them really hard, then I'm going to pull them off balance a little bit with this hand before I throw my elbow. So there are some situations where you can consider it just for ease of teaching and practice, and there are application reasons for doing it as well. So hopefully that kind of makes sense. So getting back to from stacked down to the low, you again have, I can throw this hip back, this hip forward to generate power, and I call this, again, that baseball bat type of feeling, smashing, and I can either do it, reset, hit with the punch, or I can do part way, rest of the way. Or I can do this hip forward, extending, bend back this way. These are all viable power generation methods for that sequence. They all fit different applications a little bit differently, so it's something for you to play with. When would you extend this? and then strike, as opposed to hit, pull, hit, as opposed to hit, hit. Those are things for you to play with. So I can tell you that those are all valid and, and that they all generate power, but they're all doing it a little bit differently, so you should play with those. So if we look at how that sets me up, right? I've come here, and I'm probably going to step across, right? That's generally what Nanachi will do after this sequence. From this uh, punched position, we're going to whip back for this middle. Again, my hip, probably this side, on the punching side, is a little forward because from this part, it just went that way. So it's easy for me to take this hip that's forward and pull it back to generate that whip with this side of my body. So that makes Perfect sense. You can, though, again, depending on how you step, you might set your hips a different direction. And maybe this hip is a little further back when you step out, you can throw that forward instead. Right? So now you get a little bit of forward motion on this rotation. So something to play with there as well. So either, again, we've got a starting position of hip forward or hip back. Right? You're going to see this a lot in this kata. My hips back, I'm probably going to move it forward next. If it's forward, I'm probably going to move it back next, just because that's what's going to give me the most economy of motion, the most benefit. Okay? So if I did the pull here, this hip is a little further back. So that means when I do the double, this hip is giving emphasis this direction. Right? So I've gone here, that means this low hand gets more thrust. Right? So logically, that gives me some sense of what that might do. If this side of my body is going to come forward now, that's got some emphasis, right? Whereas this is being pulled. Conversely, if I pushed this side forward to generate power for this, then this hand is being de-emphasized power-wise in that direction, right? It's getting more swing instead. 
as opposed to more thrust. So from here, hip back, we have double where this thrusts forward, as opposed to from here, double where it pulls and swings that way. Hopefully that's making sense to everybody. So again, there's a lot of this changing of directions. And from an application perspective, when we're looking at Bunkai, Naihanchi, and essentially all your other kata, because everything is Naihanchi, uses a lot of back and forth to cause whiplash, right? We want to cause the person's head to go like this so that we can knock them out easier. Everything in your hikite strike, right, probably does that. Because it's pulling them forward into something, we're going to cause that whiplash to happen, right? We have that here, all of that. Even down here, we're having that happen. So it would make sense then that mechanically you're going to be doing a lot of whipping, right? It happens in application, it's going to be part of your mechanics. So hopefully that's making sense to everybody. So back to our Nahanshidachi. And we've gone here. Again, looking at our starting point, we either have our hip on this side forward a little bit from the way we did it, or we have it back from the way we did it. Where you start might depend where you go next. So if it's forward, that sets me up to hit pretty hard with this one on the back fist. Now, some styles don't do that as a back fist, right? Some do more uppercut. Some bring it all the way around the head and swing it around. Uh, that is very stylistic because really, when you're looking at this back fist uh, motion, it's just a circle. What that circle does is up to you. So some people do this circle all the way around their head and back. Uh, some people bring it to the side of the head and back. We do a little circle in front of the face. Some do this big circle and uppercut. All it really is is a circle. So don't worry too much about trying to find the right one, the wrong one. They're all right in the right context. But whichever one you do, you have to consider what your hips can be used for. So if I have this hip pulled back, this hip uh, torque forward, that means that this in any capacity is going to hit real hard when it comes back around, right? Maybe I need some extra wind up, right? A little extra sinking if I'm going to rise up with an uppercut. But for the most part, if this hip is back, I've got a really good whip on that side of the body to throw it forward. It's a little different if that hip's already forward, right? If I pulled this back for this part. That might be a situation where I reset it by set with the grab and hit, right? That makes a lot of sense with a lot of different uh, variants of Nihanshi. Sometimes it's not a grab. I've seen some systems where it's uh, extended more like a punch and then comes out. That works too, right? This hip coming forward, punch, hit. This hip coming forward, grab, hit. Works either way. It becomes a little more problematic, right, if this hips back and you want to hit on this side without resetting this hip. It's going to be really difficult to get much power into unless you sort of pop mostly up. You have to do a little bit of a reset to be able to do that. So I try to make sure that if I have to reset the hips, that I have a purpose to the reset, right? So my general way of looking at this is no matter what I set this uh, hip into, either pulling or thrusting with it, I want to make sure that this hip comes forward for this strike, one way or the other, because that's the most effective way to use it. So if I'm going to have to reset this hip, like I said, I'm either going to punch that out or reach it out to clear before I strike, just because that is the most efficient way to make that hip turn not a waste of time and energy. Um, you know, you'll see people who like to do double hipping everything. If you do it fast enough, it really doesn't matter too much. But if you're going to have to, you know, set up hit, you might as well do something on the setup so that it's not a waste of motion. You know, it, it may not make a difference too much in time, but you might as well use it if it's there. So, of course, that gets us now to this position 
and we get these sweeps. Those sweeps or kicks, namigayashi, the returning wave, again, one of those things that's done differently in a lot of different systems. So in ours, we sweep up in front of the leg this way, right, on both sides. Some, you'll kick to your leg, and usually you're kicking right to that uh, sartorial nerve above the knee. It's generally where you're going with that. But uh, there are some other variations. I've seen, you know, big circular things, and, and sometimes you will stomp, right? So that's a matter of emphasis. And I personally recommend changing the emphasis each time you practice. So there will be times where I will do this, and I will emphasize the sweep, and I'm not emphasizing that stomp. There are other times where I will emphasize the stomp. Sometimes I will even kick and set down. So you can play with that for both the mechanics part of it and the application. So if we look at the sweep, obviously to get this hip moving and this leg moving, I have to pull to this side of my body. Uh, people like to do the, you know, stay, stay perfectly centered, you know, balance right here, sweep. But you have to go really, really fast if you're going to do that. And what was the point? That is essentially taking a table with four legs and then taking one of the legs and going, pull out, put back in, and try to do it before the table falls over. That's essentially what you're trying to do. When you could just move some legs to balance it, and then take the leg away. So personally, from my perspective, I think shifting your weight is the way to go. Just from pure mechanics, it just makes more logical sense. When you start looking at application, it becomes even more important. Reason being, if I'm going to sweep somebody, if I do it like this, I'm going to fall too. I have to catch myself. It works okay. That's fine. So you can look at it that way. But if I pull, if I actually load myself onto this other leg a little bit, then I now have the alternative of doing other steps. Right? I can stomp. I can kick. I can set back down. I have different options. So personally, I am of the opinion that this pull should center you a little more over one side and then go back out. Again, whether you stomp, kick, it's up to you. But again, you're going to use your hips for that as well. So this is a little more of a, a rotating this way type of feel to the hips as opposed to rotating in this plane, right? Instead of a, a plate this way, we're, we're looking at it this direction. So when you pull this up, right, this is going to be coming out and up. I'm exaggerating this a lot. So this is going to circle like this, right? To be able to do that. And then you can throw that same circle down for that kicker stomp. And you do that on either side. So as opposed to the plate, plate flat, we've got plate like this now circling like this. Hopefully that makes sense to everybody. Now, of course, I'm skipping all the things that are in between sides, right? So, of course, you've got here and this. Whereas before we had one, two, or one, two, now we have two hands as one. So that becomes a little different as well. So when you look at that one, right, we have this circling of the hips for that sweep stomp, that sets me up then as well because my whole body is going this way again, right? If I was balanced in the center, which you can do, you have no body weight going this way. But if I circle this and line myself up a little bit, then I get to put more body weight in the direction of the strike. So glad that makes sense, Lucas. I know I'm a little rambly sometimes, so hopefully I can stay on track. So again, with this hip motion pulling the sweep this way, and again, I'm exaggerating to make it easier to see. If I pull this way, all my body weight has to go back that way, which 
is the direction of this strike, right? So now, not only do I have my hip able to turn that way, I have my whole body weight going that way already. So it just makes it all that much more powerful. Same thing going the other way, right? Same circle, same set, body weight going this direction for that. Now, one thing I really want to highlight with that movement in particular, that is the most explicit hard twist in the kata. You know, you get people who just sort of move their arms across. This movement is really supposed to be your whole body turning at the waist, right? So from this stance, you are, you are turned way to the side, right? You are dragging somebody this way, either an arm bar, a shoulder lock, a throw, but you are dragging somebody this direction. So having your whole body moving that way, having your hip per, uh, push on this side, that direction, and twisting at the waist, right? So you're using your lats, your core overall, to twist your upper body. You should actually have a hard time breathing in because of the strength used to twist your body, okay? That then sets you up for this pull and this double arm motion. And again, just like our stacked hands before, you have options on how you do it, right? You can do the reset or you can do the straight pull. Depends on what you're doing with it, right? Either way, you're going to probably end up in a somewhat neutral hip position, so you're kind of centered, right? This double arm motion, different schools do that differently too. Uh, most Itosu lineage is going to be doing this where this arm, top arm, is lower than head level, right? And this arm is generally kind of more like that hook punch position. It's usually where people are at. Sometimes there'll be some variance on height, how far away from the body it is, that kind of thing, but that's usually what you're going to see. Some schools throw it out there and leave it wherever it ends. And that depends on where it ends right, for the school. And some pull it back. Depending on how you guys do it and how you apply it is going to kind of change your mechanics on it. So either you are throwing this hip forward, right, or you are throwing it and pulling it back. You can have a little bit of that reset, right, to stop it, even if you're not explicitly trying to pull, but you'll feel a difference between the stop it and the explicit pullback. And that is going to determine what you're using this hand for, right? Because this is making everything swing that way like a baseball bat and smash. But this hand is really gonna be affected by this pull. And even this hand is. Because up till this point, they're swinging that way. As soon as I pull this hip back, this hip's going to go forward and that arm is going to be wedged that way. Again, getting back to our thrust height though, uh, at the beginning. So that is the uh, kind of variance that you have with that. Because you're doing double arm motions, you've got a lot of different things going on. But that is the first half of the cup. Which means that is all of the kata, because at that point you just do all that stuff the other direction. So uh, I actually went a little longer than I thought I was going to today, uh, but I started a couple minutes late, so I figured that's fair. Hopefully that made sense to you guys. Hopefully that gives you some uh, ideas for how to play with the stance and your hips and all the movements that go together in that kata and uh, gives you some new things to play with uh, in your training. Uh, I figure I'll give a little bit of question time if anybody has any. And you're welcome, Lucas. I'll hang out here and just kind of put my ugly mug in the middle of your screen until you decide to, uh, you know, either close out the video or <laughs> ask me something uh, for a little bit before I head home and get some food. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Well, like I said, I'm sure I went over some things that uh, your style may not do, or that may even be considered uh, incorrect in your style, might be considered wrong. Uh, and 
that's okay. Every system is going to be a little bit different, and personally, I think exploring those differences can give you a lot of interesting ideas that can uh, improve the overall understanding you have of karate, uh, and it gives you more flavor for your karate. You aren't just a you know, standard copy of somebody else's karate. You have your own uh, different little preferences and aspects to it. So uh, I think that's a good thing to get. Oh, well, there's some more people coming in a little bit late. So don't worry, guys. After a little bit, this will sit here on Instagram for 24 hours. Um, if anybody wants to view it again, should be able to just go to my Instagram profile and tap the uh, circle logo icon to watch the live uh, version or click on my story and tap over. Harrybug1, what is my Okinawan style? I practice Shorinryu, specifically Kobayashi Shorinryu as part of the Shorin Khan, uh, but I also do Kishimoto-di, which is a rare uh, Shurite system. Uh, but I didn't go over that too much today because the mechanics are different. Me, I'm Mike. Do you ever use the cross step for a grapevine wrapping your leg? Absolutely we do. Uh, more in Nahanshi Nidan. Uh, but yeah, it's the same kind of idea. Anytime you uh, cross your legs like that from an application perspective, that can be crossing the opponent's leg. So there's a lot of different ways to apply that. Asked a question on the question feature. <laughs> yes, some styles do emphasize level hips throughout this kata. Um, even ours, for the most part, does. It's more the head height that most people don't want to change. But... Uh, if you lock yourself into one plane of movement, you really kind of limit your whole perspective. We make space for them to fall. So when it comes to neck cranks, uh, whether you make space for them to fall or kind of stay close to them, kind of depends on whether you want to get rid of them or not. Uh, so when, if you're neck cranking somebody with this, for example, if you want to kind of stay on top of them and keep them controlled, then you're not going to want to give them space. You're going to want to leave them in an uncomfortable position. Um, but if you're just trying to get rid of them, then yeah, make space. Uh, the benefit of not maintaining level hips. So depends on what you mean by level hips, Paul. So like I said, I was talking about uh, looking at it kind of like a, a turning plate or a turnstile, either this way or this way. So in that respect, you, having level hips takes out this whole plane of movement. Um, and you can play with different kind of figure eight motions with generating power as well, because you've got things that go down or up. Uh, so you have the ability then to not just turn, but to drop and rise, which especially becomes important if you're striking, for example, upward, right? any of the upward ones, or downward. You get to pull not just back, but down. If you're talking level hips, as in trying to maintain a single height through the kata, um, then you really just miss out on any of your potential level change power generation. Um, you don't do too much of that in this kata, and I will bring up Kishimoto D here, because in this stance, one of the things you can't really do is squat. Because after a certain point, your knees aren't tracking over your toes anymore, and they're not doing you any good, right? If you are in shikodachi, you can squat pretty darn well. So Kishimoto di uses shikodachi to generate a lot of power by squatting and rising. So you do lose that a little bit with the head height thing. Let me see if I can scroll through. I saw stuff roll on by. Okay, okay, oh, I'm knocking my phone over. Shuriru, very similar. So I actually, uh, Harry Bug, I started in uh, Trias Shuriru, actually, in Illinois, uh, under Joseph Walker and Joey Johnston. So I am quite familiar with Shuriru. All right, looks like the questions have abated for now. Uh, and of course, you guys are welcome to send me messages. I usually get a few of them after I do these. So I am going to close up the shop, get uh, changed, go get some food. But uh, again, if you guys have any questions, feel free, shoot me a message, and uh, hope that was helpful. Have a good day.